Hello, everyone. My name is Cody Morey, and I'm here again with Pastor Bill Hughes of Truth Triumphant. And we are going to discuss a pressing issue today in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and in Christianity Abroad, which is about the feast days. Are we to keep them? Uh, what are the significance for us today and relevance for us? What about the past? What about the present? What about the future? All these questions we're going to look into today with the feast days. So before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for your presence, which is always abiding with us, Lord. Thank you that you don't forsake us. Thank you that you overcome our mistakes. Help us to be overcomers, Lord, Amen. in all facets of life. Help us to learn the truth of your Bible. Help us to learn the truth of the feast days and this issue for us today, Lord. We love you. We praise you. We ask that you be here with us today and guide our thoughts and our hearts towards you. In amen. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Bill, it's been a couple of weeks uh, since our last interview. How have you been? Doing well, Cody. I just got back from the West Coast with meetings out there, and uh, they went very well. Uh, got to visit with family, which was very nice. See my mother and rest of the family. So that was very nice. Uh, meetings went well. Of course, we all got through Hurricane Irma. Uh, losing power for several days, but I uh, think it was a learning experience for all of us. I think we all learned something from it. I know I did. So, But I'm excited to get back in our, uh, our little uh, pressing issues, our studies, that uh, our interviews together. So I'm looking forward to today. If you don't mind me asking, what was it that you learned, um, on a side note real quick, that you learned from Hurricane Irma? Well, Cody, this was the first time in my life, 60 years, that I've ever uh, been without power. Um, never had the lights go out as they did for three days. And so, uh, number one, Cody, not being mechanically uh, oriented, uh, number one, I learned how to use a generator that I had never used in my life. Number two, I realized that uh, the next time I hear of a storm coming that has any possibility of hitting the state of Florida with any kind of, of power, uh, I will immediately take my gas cans and go fill them up. Because really, Cody, it's not the hurricane itself, it's the aftermath. So if you lose power for several days, you've got to have gasoline to keep the generator going. And uh, if you have the generator, then you're able to preserve the, your food in your refrigerator, your freezer. Uh, you're able to have some fans on in your home and to have a light here or there. So... Uh, I learned, Cody, that those are necessary preps that have to be in place before the hurricane hits. And then, of course, you're uh, making sure you have plenty of water on hand, which we always do, uh, plus, of course, food, which are kind of no-brainers. It's the gasoline that, uh, that I, really, I really learned from that, Cody. I learned how to take care of the generator now, so I feel comfortable with that. And now for next time, it'll be having the gas cans on hand, because once people realize a hurricane's coming, those things disappear uh, off the shelf. So, uh, but it was, it was a very good experience, and um, I'm grateful that we had it. I'm grateful as well. I actually had a, um, during, during the when everything got shut off in the aftermath and the power was out and work was canceled for a couple of days and school was canceled for a week um, I had nothing to do 
you know, um, other than clean up around the house and stuff. And I had a moment of clarity where I began to think clearly. I began to hear the voice of God, and it has. I noticed that my life was too cluttered, and that I need to make more time for Him. Yeah. So. It's a good thing. Interesting. <laughs> but it's a good thing. The Lord uses these events um, for His glory and His will, and are thankful for the lessons. Absolutely, Cody. Absolutely. So today's pressing issue is uh, the feast days. Now, this is something that goes back and forth. Some say uh, you don't need to know anything about them at all. Others say that would be the pendulum one way. And then the pendulum being swung the other way. Some say that this is a salvation issue in the last days that we need to, essentially as repairers of the breach, that that's part of the, that message. Mm -hmm. So, just to start off, what are the feast days, and then what do they mean for a Christian? Well, Cody, the feast days served a very valuable purpose in the Old Testament. Very valuable. Uh, for example, there were five feast days, Cody. There was Passover. There was Pentecost, which took place 50 days after the wave sheaf that was part of the Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, so there was the Passover Unleavened Bread, then the Pentecost, then those were the two spring feasts. Then in the autumn, several months later, you had the Feast of Trumpets, which took place in the seventh month, the first day. Then 10 days after that, you had the Feast of Atonement or Feast of Judgment. And then five days after that, you had the Feast of Tabernacles. And Cody, in Colossians chapter 2, which I find to be just <laughs> a fa fascinating passage of Scripture, in Colossians chapter 2, the Bible says, we'll start with verse 11, because in this passage, Cody, we're going to see that the Apostle Paul says that the feast days were a shadow of things to come. And that as a shadow, they were pointing to the substance, the body, and the body was Christ. So, Cody, the beauty of the feast days is that they pointed forward to Jesus. And they told us things that he would do on behalf of every child of humanity. So that's the beauty, Cody, of the feast days, is that they teach us about what Jesus did and about what Jesus is doing right now and what he's going to do in the very near future. So in Colossians 2, we'll pick up in verse 11. Paul says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Well, Cody, right there in verse 11, Paul very clearly is saying that circumcision, it was a outward sign, it was a physical sign of something that God wanted to do in every human being's heart. And that circumcision, while it was the cutting away of the skin on a male child, that represented, Cody, a great spiritual truth that no human being is able to resist the power of sin. Nobody can do that, Cody, by themselves. We are all subject to sin. We are all born with a nature that wants to sin. And, Cody, the Apostle Paul says that circumcision represented the fact that it was only through Jesus Christ and an acceptance of him that we could resist the power of sin 
in our lives. And in that vein, Paul goes on, he says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So, Cody, just as circumcision was a sign that it is only through the power of Jesus Christ that we can resist the authority of sin in our lives. So baptism. Baptism, as Paul lays out in Romans chapter 6, but also mentions it here in Colossians 2, baptism represented the fact that for a human being to receive the power of Jesus in their life by faith, they must, Cody, they must put up a fight to oppose what our carnal nature naturally suggests to us. And baptism is a sign of that. Because when Jesus died, Cody, he went down into the grave and he took with him that carnal nature, Cody, that he carried with him throughout his time here on earth. And so Christ hurled that nature into the tomb, and when he rose again, Cody, that carnal nature was dead. And so likewise, Cody, our carnal nature, we must put up a battle, a war against that nature. And... Cody, we rely upon Christ to empower us to do what we can't do. It's in that vein then that Paul continues on and will now, in the next several verses, mention the feast days. It says, And you being dead in your sins and the uncleanness of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You know, Cody, people, humanity, they live with a burden of guilt, of past wrongs that they have committed, people they have hurt, things they have done that have hurt themselves in whatever fashion. You can think of so many different ways that we all have hurt ourselves. But Paul says that through Christ, we can be forgiven for all those things. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So, Cody, there was something written, some law that was written that Christ nailed to the cross. Now, most people today will say, well, that law was the Ten Commandments. Well, Cody, an ordinance is a law. It's also a law that you actually participate in. For example, Cody, when people participate in communion, they call it the ordinance of communion or that first part of that service when we wash one another's feet. We call that the ordinance of humility. So, Cody, an ordinance is a law. There's no doubt about that. But it's also something that people participate in. Well, Verse 14 says that those ordinances were nailed to the cross. So, Cody, there's no question that there was a law that was nailed to the cross. There's no doubt about that. Paul goes on. He's not clear exactly which one it was just yet, but he will become very clear. Verse 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, verse 16 and 17, 
Paul says, because there was a law, because there was an ordinance that was nailed to the cross, he says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. Or of the Sabbath. The word days is actually supplied. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body, and the word is, is supplied as well. So it should say, but the body of Christ. Well, Cody, the Apostle Paul says there was a law that was nailed to the cross because it was nobody should judge another in meat or drink or in respect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath because they were a shadow pointing forward to Christ who was the substance. Well, Cody, the Bible says there in Colossians 2.16, it mentions five things. And because there was a law nailed to the cross, the Bible says don't judge people in these five things. Meat or drink or holy day or new moon or Sabbath. Now, Cody, the Apostle Paul, when he wrote these things, there was no such thing as a New Testament. All we had, Cody, was the Old Testament scriptures. So, Cody, we need to analyze and ask ourselves, where do we find these five things that Paul mentioned in verse 16? Because, Cody, these five things were a part of the ordinances, part of some law that was nailed to the cross. And within those ordinances, Cody, these were all pointing forward to something Christ would do. Well, Cody, a lot of people would say, well, the meat part and the drink part, that has to do with eating flesh food and not drinking intoxicating liquor. Now, Cody, granted... The eating of flesh food is not what is best for us to eat. We were not made to eat flesh food. Nor were we made, Cody, to drink intoxicating beverages. The Bible is clear that wine is a mocker, strong drink is, a ra is raging, and he that drinketh thereof is not wise. That's very clear, Cody. But that's not what Colossians 2, verse 16 is talking about. These five elements, Cody, the meat, the drink, the holy day, the new moon, and the Sabbath, those five elements, Cody, were all part of the Jewish feast days. Every feast day had meat offerings, drink offerings, holy days, New moon and Sabbath. All five, all the feasts did, Cody. And we find that very clearly in Numbers chapter 28. Numbers chapter 28. Actually, you'll find it in Numbers chapters 28 and 29. Let's notice, Cody. We'll just look at the first feast. And then after that, first off, we'll see those five characteristics that we noticed in Colossians 2. Then we'll look, Cody, at how each feast was a shadow pointing forward to Jesus. Proverbs chapter 28, starting with verse 16. The Bible says, In the fourteenth day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. And in the fifteenth day of this month is the feast. Seven days shall unleavened bread be eaten. Well, Cody, right there we recognize the first characteristic of the feast days. They're all built upon the new moon. All the feasts, Cody, were based upon the monthly cycle. 
as we just noticed in those verses. The Passover was based on the 14th day of the first month. So there's your new moons. Verse 18, the Bible says, And the first day shall be a holy convocation. Well, there's your holy day, which was another characteristic that Paul mentioned in Colossians chapter 2. It goes on, it says, Ye shall do no servile, you shall do no manner of servile work therein. Well, Cody, whenever people set aside a day and don't do work, that's a Sabbath. So now we have our third characteristic. So far we've seen new moon, we've seen holy day, and we've seen Sabbath. If we go on further, down to verse 20, the Bible says, Their meat offering shall be of flour mingled with oil. Three-tenth deals shall ye offer for a bullock, and two-tenth deals for a ram. Well, there's your meat, Cody, right there. There's your meat offering. So there's four characteristics now that Paul mentioned in Colossians chapter 2. Finally, Cody, verse 24, the Bible says, After this manner ye shall offer daily throughout the seven days the meat of the sacrifice made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. It shall be offered beside the continual burnt offering and the drink offering. Well, Cody, there's your fifth characteristic. You had meat offering. You had drink offering right there. You had a holy day. You had it based on the new moon. And you had the Sabbath. So, Cody, Paul says that it was these ordinances, these handwritten ordinances from Colossians 2, Numbers chapter 28 and 29, that were blotted out, Cody. They were blotted out at the cross. And because they were, no one was to judge anybody on what the meat or drink or holy day or new moon or Sabbath. No judging on those, Cody. Why? Because they were blotted out at the cross of Christ. Now, Cody, in Colossians 2, finishing up, Paul said they were all a shadow pointing to the body of Christ. Well, Cody, the Passover, the sacrificing of a lamb, the sprinkling of blood on the doorpost represented Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb. So the Passover, Cody, pointed forward to Christ's death on the cross for each and every child of humanity. Fifty days later, Cody, after Jesus' resurrection, Pentecost came in Acts chapter 2. That, Cody, represented the fact that Jesus Christ began his work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Because if you remember, Cody, after Jesus' resurrection, he went back to heaven to confirm that his sacrifice had been accepted by the Father he then came back down, Cody, and was here for 40 days. He then went back up, and 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, Christ began his work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So the two spring festivals, Cody, pointed forward to Christ's death and the beginning of his work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Now, Cody, as we've mentioned, there were then three fall feasts that came toward the end of the year. The Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Cody, the Feast of Trumpets was the blast. It's in Leviticus. All of these are mentioned in greater detail, Cody, in Leviticus chapter 23. 
the Feast of Trumpets was a warning, Cody, that 10 days from now, judgment was going to come. So it was a warning that the day of judgment was fast approaching. Well, Cody, that Feast of Trumpets occurred in the 1830s when William Miller and a host of other people all over the world preached that Christ would return in the early 1840s, in the 1843, 1844 realm, and that judgment would fall upon the inhabitants of the world at the second coming of Christ. Now, Cody, obviously those people misunderstood the event, but nevertheless, Cody, they warned the world that judgment was coming in the 1843-1844 time frame. They misunderstood exactly what Christ was going to do. Instead of coming to the earth, Cody, Christ began his judgment ministry in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. That is clearly laid out, Cody, in Daniel 8.14, in Revelation 14.7, and in Leviticus chapter 16. So, the Feast of Trumpets, Cody, pointed forward to Christ warning the world that judgment was coming. The Feast of Atonement, or Feast of Judgment, pointed forward, Cody, to October 22, 1844, when Christ began His work in the Most Holy Place. And then finally, Cody, the Feast of Tabernacles came five days after that Feast of Atonement. And the Feast of Tabernacles, Cody, is outlined in Leviticus 23, pointed forward to the time, Cody, when there would be a final ingathering of all of God's children throughout the ages at the second coming of Christ, and they would all be raised to meet Christ and to be with Him forever. So, Cody, all of the trumpets, I mean, all of the feasts, pointed forward to something that Christ would do on behalf of humanity. His death his work in the holy place, his warnings that judgments are soon to fall, his work in the most holy place, and his second coming. So the feasts, Cody, are beautiful, and they truly are a shadow pointing forward to the substance who was Jesus Christ. Thank you for that. Bill, uh, what I'm hearing you say here, to quickly summarize it, there was a lot there, um, but that the feast days are extremely important. They are extremely important. They were the foundation for the Jewish economy in the past, Absolutely. and they've always been an object lesson either of Christ or of events. So it's always been a prophetic um, occurrence and also trying to get people to understand what God was doing in the sanctuary system and the removal of sin um, and also that each one of the feasts at this point has been fulfilled except one we are just awaiting the feast of tabernacle so when we do study these these feast days we can learn what God's will is and what his plan is for us, either in reflection to events of the past, such as 1830s, the um, Millerite movement, up until Christ going into the most holy place in 1844, and even back further on the day of Pentecost. So when we study these things, we can understand what God has been doing and what he plans to do in the future for us. Absolutely, Cody. The, the feast days are beautiful, Cody. They're beautiful uh, because they teach us so much. Cody, if we want to understand right now what Christ is doing 
in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Cody, all we got to do is go back to Leviticus chapter 16, go to Leviticus 23, 26 to 32. Cody, there is tremendous, beautiful truth that teaches us exactly what Christ is doing today. And it also, Cody, teaches us exactly what God wants from us in this end time day of atonement. So the feast days are beautiful, Cody, where, where the line, Cody, where the proverbial line is drawn in the sand is when people today say, you must keep the feast days in order to be saved. And that the feast days today are still binding on humanity. Cody, that's where the line is drawn in the sand. No, the feast days are not a salvational issue today. Number two, no, we do not keep the feast days today. Uh, Cody, it's, again, it, it comes back, and this is a reoccurring theme that I think we're going to see repeatedly. Just like the issue that we just recently dis, uh, discussed on the Holy Spirit, Cody, it all comes down to our emphasis. It all comes down to, Cody, what is our focus? Cody, if we are focusing on the Holy Spirit as the third person of the Godhead who empowers us to obey God's law, well, it's a beautiful truth, Cody. It's a beautiful truth. But Cody, if we make it the Holy Spirit and His person a salvational issue, now, Cody, we have created a distraction. We have created a focus that is extreme. And it's the same with the feast days. If we make this salvational, Cody, then we have made a wrong focus where now we, we zero in on those days and we keep them today as if that's what God intends. And Cody, it is not what God intends. In fact, Cody, in Galatians, the book of Galatians, Cody, we find the Apostle Paul coming up against a group of people in the churches that he established in Galatia. And we find, Cody, in verse 6, Paul said this to the Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. We find Paul stating this was a problem. He said, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Well, Cody, there were people going throughout the Galatian churches and they were saying, it's not about Christ. It's not about submission to His authority in your life. No, it's about something else. And that's what Paul's dealing with here. He says there was a perverted gospel being preached in the Galatian churches. Well, Cody... In Galatians chapter 2, it becomes very clear what one of those Gospels was. And it was circumcision. There were Jews going throughout saying, you've got to be circumcised to be saved. That was one of the Gospels, Cody. But Cody, the other Gospel that was going through the churches of Galatia is found in Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. Paul said, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, 
How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. Now, Cody, Paul condemns the Judaizers going through Galatia who are saying you've got to keep the ceremonial Sabbath days. You've got to keep the new moons. You've got to keep the set or appointed times for the feasts. And you've got to keep the jubilee years. Paul says those were, when you make them salvational, when you make that your focus, he said those are weak and beggarly elements. Why, Cody? Because there's no power. There's no power, Cody, in any feast day. The power, Cody, was in Christ. The power was through submission to the authority of Jesus Christ. And that is why Paul called the feast days weak and beggarly elements. Because there's no power in them, Cody, to save anyone from the authority of sin in their life. So, the focus, Cody, is on submission to the power of Christ. Therein is the gospel that leads to salvation. So, essentially... These Judaizers, back then, and we could bring it up today by saying that they were adding angels to the messages, essentially. Mm -hmm. Instead of focusing on the simplistic uh, teaching in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12, which tells us to teach the three angels' message throughout the entire world. And it's about the Sabbath, the investigative judgment, the man of sin, uh, the Sunday law, mark of the beast. Um, and there's, health me there's a health message in there as well. Absolutely. Because that's about uh, giving glory to God, of course. But there's not a mention of keeping the feast days or of a right understanding of the Holy Spirit. They're simply not there. And as, as you pointed out in Colossians chapter 2, which a lot of people actually use to go the other way with it. Um, right, good. And Galatians chapter 4, when you put them side by side and view them together, you see that the message back then I'm seeing is, it, it, it's always been about prophecy and about pointing people to the sanctuary and seeing how these things have been fulfilled. Just like back then, we're having the same thing happen today where people, instead of, instead of seeing that and focusing on the gospel of Christ, are now focusing on all the things that have been fulfilled. When really these things, uh, they were object lessons, they were important, um, they've, they're still important, and they're, mm -hmm. they're only binding in the sense that they are being fulfilled in reality, in the spiritual truth. They're being fulfilled in heaven and on earth, the actual event, not just um, the remembrance of it. Cody, you make a great point. The simplistic messages of Revelation 14. And the, the summary, Cody, of the three angels' messages as you've so excellently laid out in Revelation 14, 6 to 12. Cody, the bottom line in verse 12 says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So, Cody... <laughs> You know, if Revelation 14, verse 12 said, here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the feast days and, and are saved through them. Well, then, Cody, we better be keeping the feast days. 
But the Bible doesn't say that. And, uh, you know, Cody, what comes to mind is, because this is so very simple, when somebody gets sidetracked on a side issue, on a distraction, Cody, I believe it's because they no longer want to hear that good old gospel message of the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They want to come up with something new, Cody, because obedience to the law of God, Cody, and the faith of Jesus, it demands of every human being, it demands the absolute submission and the absolute death of our carnal nature. And so much, so many people in humanity, they don't want that. They want to live it up. They want to live a sinful life that says you can do whatever you want and I'm still going to, you know, I'm still going to go to heaven. Well, the Bible doesn't say that, Cody. And so folk reject this simple message, but in order to maintain a religious veneer, they have to adopt something that still has a religious feel to it. Well, the feast days do. Uh, the personality of the Holy Spirit that has a religious veneer to it. And so people get distracted and eventually Cody will be lost because of it. Thank you, Bill. It's having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, essentially. Amen. And Absolutely. These focuses, as you pointed out, it's the law of God that is the last day issue. That's what our focus needs to be. Amen, Cody. Um, Amen. You've answered that. You've answered the relevance. Let's see. You've answered that. Okay, um, I'm going to put forth uh, one of the arguments. What about Paul keeping the feast days? After the ascension of Jesus Christ, and if you would turn with me real quick uh, to Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 18 and verse 21, Acts chapter 18 and verse 21, uh, let's see, okay. And this is Paul speaking um, right before he, uh, he left Ephesus to head to Jerusalem. He says, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep the feast that cometh to Jerusalem. But I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And then there's also, if you jump forward real quick, uh, it makes the, basically the same point. In Acts chapter 20, verse 16, it says, For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend time in Asia. For he, fa he hasted if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. <coughs> Cody, the Bible, and th this comes down, Cody, to a basic um, understanding, I believe, of the character of God. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. Every, every Bible verse, as Paul said in, in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So everything in Scripture, Cody, is in harmony. There, there's no... And if we find disharmony, it's because we're misinterpreting the passage. So, but all Scripture harmonizes with itself. So, Cody, in Colossians 2, as we've already looked at, Galatians chapter 4, 9, and 10, which we've looked at, Cody, there is nothing, there is nothing in Scripture in the Old Testament, there is nothing in there that has meat, drink, holy day, new moon, and Sabbath. Nothing but the Jewish feast days. So, 
if we're going to take the passages we just read in Acts chapter 18 and the one in Acts chapter 20, where clearly Paul wanted to get to Jerusalem for Pentecost. He wanted to be there. So we would have to step back, Cody, and say, okay, either we have completely misinterpreted Colossians 2 and Galatians 4, which, Cody, I don't believe we have, because there's nothing else in the Old Testament that deals with those things but the feast days. So then I would have to ask myself the question, well, then, was the Holy Spirit confused? And I think, Cody, we would have to say, well, of course not. The Holy Spirit is not confused, nor is the Apostle Paul confused. So how do we harmonize what Paul said in Colossians, what Paul said in Galatians, with the statements in Acts chapters 18 and 20? And Cody, I think it's very, very simple. And that is this. Cody, for every, for almost every feast that the Jews had in Jerusalem, there were between two to three million Jews in attendance there. And Cody, Paul wanted so desperately to teach the gospel of Christ and the importance of Christ in all the Jewish economy, from the feast to the sanctuary to the law, he wanted the Jews to, so desperately he wanted them to understand the great truths of salvation in Christ through the entire Jewish economy. And Cody, it is for that reason that Paul earnestly wanted to get to Jerusalem for the Jewish feasts, because he wanted to witness to all the Jews in attendance to the great truths of salvation through the Jewish economy as they pointed forward to Jesus. Now that, Cody, in light of Paul's statements where he says, to the Jew, I became a Jew, that I might win some. To the Gentile, I became a Gentile. Paul was consumed, Cody, with one goal, and that was to share the great truths of salvation through Christ as they were represented through the Old Testament. That, Cody, completely harmonizes all of Scripture where there is absolutely no um, confusion, no contradiction whatsoever. So, essentially, these passages, he's not laying down a principle to keep the feast days, but he's laying down a principle to take the opportunities that come your way to preach the gospel. Absolutely, Cody. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also here, I, what I was thinking of, I was when you had mentioned that, it said, I remember the, that passage you brought up, and the Apostle Paul says he, be, he has become all things to all people so that he may win some for Christ. Absolutely. So that was his goal, that was his focus, if there's a principle being laid down there. It's not that he earnestly needed to keep Pentecost in order to be saved. <laughs> that actually wouldn't make sense with the Christians he was speaking to. Because he wasn't telling them to come with him, was he? No, he and they were Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't telling them to come with him. So he wasn't Judaizing him, them himself. He was going to take advantage of an opportunity that he saw in order to reach his people, which he had a great burden for. If you read you know, Romans, you can see how much of a burden he had. And... Also, it, goes with the, it really goes with the theme of Acts. The theme of Acts, from start to finish, it's all about 
the the gospel of Christ going out into the world that fits directly within that theme. Totally, Cody. Absolutely, totally. Um, I have another verse for you. Sure. Um, also from the Apostle Paul, it's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 um, and verse 6 through 8. Okay. Uh, I'm in 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 5 and verses 6 through 8. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, <laughs> neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So, what the... Uh, feast day proponent would state here is he he says right here let us therefore keep the feast mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. your response Cody it, it's very clear in this passage that Paul's great concern is because leaven you know the leaven unleavened bread the the leaven was the yeast and it was the, the leaven or the yeast, Cody, that permeated the bread and it completely changed it. You know, if you put, if you have a loaf of bread and you don't put the yeast in it or the leaven, well, Cody, it's as hard as a rock, you know, and it's, it's small and it's, it's just, a, you know, <laughs> it's very difficult to eat. But if you put the leaven in or the yeast in, well, that makes it soft and fluffy and, and just delicious. And you can cut it up and eat it. Well, Cody, in Christ's teachings, he told the, the disciples, he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And so, Cody, Christ's emphasis and Paul's emphasis was identical. The Jews, Cody, became consumed with the, the outward husk or the outward shell. They lost complete sight of the whole point of the feasts. They lost complete sight of what the symbolic services were all about. And so they emphasized... They majored in minors, in other words. They, they majored in what wasn't important. And so Paul's point here in discussing leaven and unleavened bread, let's see, let's go back here. He says, your glorying is not good. Don't you, know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Well, Cody, leaven was hypocrisy. Christ said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which was hypocrisy. So, Cody, Paul was emphasizing, you let a little bit of sin into the life. You refuse to surrender to Jesus all. It's going to consume your whole life. It's going to take over and destroy the moral fabric of your being. And so Paul's emphasis, Cody, notice verse 7. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So, Cody, again, Paul's emphasis is, let's allow the power of Christ to drive sin out of the life. And Cody, that was the whole point of the Passover service. But the Jews got so wound up in making sure there's, there's no leaven in it, uh, making sure that they offered the exact sacrifice. Cody, it was all about the outward performance 
of actions, of, of ordinances. And Paul says you're missing the whole boat. The whole boat is, is the allowing of Christ to expel sin from the life. That's the point of the Passover service. And so that's Paul's whole, whole issue, Cody. And so then in verse 8 when he says, Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven. Cody, he goes right back to the, the focus of the leaven or of sin in the life. He says... Let us there, you know, keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity, of sincerity and truth. So Cody, Paul Ho's issue here was, let the grace of Christ take control of the heart and of the mind so that we're not going to be keeping some outward religious tradition but holding on to malice and anger and lust and cruelty inside because Paul says no feast no outward religious act has any meaning whatsoever Cody if it doesn't touch the heart if it doesn't bring us to submission of our mind and our will to the control of God then, Cody, every religious act is meaningless. And that's Paul's whole argument here. That's his whole argument. Appreciate that, Bill. Um, so, essentially, Paul is, is, is establishing a spiritual truth here. We can't just flip the switch back and forth to whether he's talking about literal things or spiritual things. The whole time he's talking about the spiritual truth. And Jesus Christ is sacrificed for us, therefore let us keep the feast. And that would be, let us keep the point of the feast. Exactly. Right? Exactly, um, Cody. Not with the old leaven, so not with sin, but with the leaven of, neither with the leaven of malice, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So he's talking about that, that change, that new creation that Christ makes in us it's the entire thing is a spiritual principle he's establishing not a literal one Cody throughout Paul's writings if it was circumcision repeatedly through Paul's writings Paul makes it very clear because the Jews Cody for thousands of years they got so hung up on the outward act that they killed the one to whom all their ceremonies pointed. And Paul says, please, don't do, don't do what your ancestors did. If you do, it, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. So. What will happen if a Christian does not keep the feast days? Cody, if a Christian is in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ and is allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to enable him to keep the commandments of God, they don't need any feast days, Cody. Because, Cody, there's no power, there's no feast day that has power to help me resist sin. Passover doesn't help me do that. But the one to whom Passover points, to Jesus Christ, oh yes, he can empower me to resist sin. The Feast of Pentecost, does it have power to keep me from falling? No. No, it doesn't, Cody. But it points forward to a high priest in the holy place in the sanctuary who can keep me from falling. So Cody, no feast can save. But Christ, as our only mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, and as Jude 24 says, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling, he can't. 
And it's to him, Cody, that we must point all the feasts and all the sanctuary services in the Old Testament to Jesus Christ and him alone. What would you say to individuals that choose to keep the feast days? Cody, a few years ago, I lose track of time. Maybe it was a little over a year ago now. I was in a meeting with an individual that um, adamantly declared that we have to keep the feast days or we're lost. And Cody, based on Colossians 2 and Galatians chapter 4, I said to the individual, because all of the feast days point forward to Christ, if we keep the feast today, then we are rejecting what Christ did. We're rejecting, if we sacrifice lambs, Cody, today and keep the Passover, then we're rejecting the Passover lamb of Christ Jesus, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Cody, we can't have both. We can't have the Passover and the sacrifice of lambs today and have Jesus at the same time. We either embrace Christ as the Passover sacrifice or we kill a lamb in our backyard. We can't have both, Cody. So we do the feast days today, Cody. We're rejecting Jesus. It's that simple. That would probably be why um, the Apostle Paul was so adamant about correcting that in Galatians chapter 4 and especially in um, Colossians chapter 2. Absolutely good. So for a Christian, for a Christian, uh, especially this usually happens to younger Christians, you know, they'll hear somebody say, oh, you have to keep the feast days and wanting to try to do the right thing, they will start to do that. But as you've stated here, that has absolutely no impact on your salvation. Your focus needs to be on the law of God, and in order to keep that law complete and utter uh, subjection to Christ and the Holy Spirit. Absolutely, Cody. You know, Cody, as, as you brought out a little while ago, in the, the simplicity of the three angels' messages, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. There's no feast days there, Cody. There's no feast days. It's Our focus needs to be on the law of God because that that's always been the issue for all time. That's the issue with Satan it only makes sense that it would be the issue again. It's the only reason Satan, the only reason Satan was removed from heaven was because he broke the law of God. It has nothing to do with feast days or his understanding of the Holy Spirit. It's all about the law. So it makes sense that in the end of times it would be all about the law again because that's the minimum requirements to get into heaven is to keep God's law. So that needs to be our focus because we are utterly helpless to keep it on our own. Absolutely, Cody. Absolutely, Cody. It's an impossibility. Uh, I mean, Cody, how, how can a carnal, sinful nature do something that's holy? That's impossible. That's impossible. But... If a carnal, sinful person will admit their own weakness, will admit their need, and that they themselves cannot produce purity and holiness, well then, Cody, that individual will cry out for someone outside of themselves. Because it's not in them. It's not in us. But when they see the, the righteous, 
requirements of the law of God. They will cry out, Cody, for someone outside of them to help them to do what they can't do. And the only one, Cody, who can keep the righteous, perfect, pure law of God was Jesus Christ. He was the only one, Cody. And so, if I cry out to Christ, then He can give me His purity. He can give me His righteousness. And in that, Cody, He can empower me to obey that perfect law. Amen. Um, so, that brings to the next question. Why is this such a prevalent movement, not only in Seventh-day Adventism, but in the Christian world? This is a big movement. Why is this such a big movement today? Cody, I believe it's a big movement because I think, Cody, that the devil is doing everything he possibly can to turn people away from the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. The law of God, faith of Jesus. Cody, it's too simple. And the devil wants to help people maintain a religious feeling so they feel like they're still religious. And they still feel like they're going to heaven because they're doing something that has religious overtones. Feast days. Uh, believing the Holy Spirit is a presence. You know, those have a religious feel to them, Cody. It makes people feel religious when they talk about religious things. And so it's a deception of the devil, Cody, to make people feel they're religious, but, Cody, it's going to keep them outside of heaven. And the more people, Cody, the devil can distract and mislead and sidestep away from the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, the more people he can destroy, the more people he can keep out of heaven. And if he gets everybody, Cody, on one of these issues that people are making salvational, if he gets everybody, Cody, on at least one of them, then Jesus can't come. It sounds to me like it's working for your salvation, which is impossible. Because I, I can keep feast days. If you said, this is, you, give, you give me these five feast days, you keep these, you're going to heaven. I could do it. I could do it. It might take a little work, but I could do it. Mm -hmm. But that's the difference, isn't it? The difference is that you can't keep the law of God. Here's the requirement. You can't do it, though. That's right. But you, you can do it through the gift of Jesus Christ. You are freed from the bondage of sin. So this, essentially what I'm hearing you say is this is a distraction from the devil. And it's, it's an ultimate deception because it makes people think they're saved. Absolutely. It's different than being just out in the world and, and, and not knowing good or bad and just ignoring all the things. It's worse because it, you think that you're, you're going to the right place and doing the right things, but you're actually on the bullet train to hell. That's exactly right, Cody. You know, Cody. Very scary. It, it's, it is, Cody. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 and onward. Jesus said, Matthew 7, verse 21. Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, and that of course is the second coming, Cody. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? So Cody... There will be multitudes at the second coming of Christ who will say, Lord, I did all these great things. I prophesied in your name. I cast out devils. I did wonderful works. I kept the feast days. I I spoke on religious subjects. And Jesus said, the only ones who are going into the kingdom are those who do the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Now, Cody, in the Messianic, the prophecy in Psalms 40, verses 6 through 8, that clearly is talking about Christ, Jesus said, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law, is within my heart. So Cody, when Jesus said, not everyone that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. The will of the Father, Cody, is that we are in submission to his authority in submission to the authority of the Ten Commandments. And Cody, you go down. After these people make this profession in verse 22, Jesus said, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work Iniquity. Cody, <laughs> my wife has told me, she said, Bill, I'm, I'm convinced if you wanted to, you could stand on your head and you could preach sermons on the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Without a Bible, just standing on your head and you could do it. And I said, Hody, you're probably right. But she says, And what good will that do you or anyone else when Jesus comes again? And Cody, she's absolutely right. Jesus made it clear there. He said, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Cody, If you or I or anyone else are not in the kingdom of God, it's going to come down to one thing, Cody. It's not the feast days. It's not who the Holy Spirit is. It's not what we call God or what day we think Jesus rose from the dead. Cody, that's all side issues. One issue, Cody. Am I allowing God to empower me to resist sin? Or am I imbibing it? Bottom line, case closed, story over. Story over, Cody. That's it. It's interesting in that verse it says, they're discussing their works. They're saying we've done these wonderful things. Absolutely. And he says, depart from me, you that work iniquity so he tells them right then and there that these side issues that you focused on or obviously the rejection of being in submission to to god leads to an inadequate ability to keep the law so they become workers of iniquity instead and the word iniquity translated in the greek means willful transgression 
So they knew right and they did wrong. And that's what's so scary about this is that this feast day issues, the Holy Spirit, whether or not we should be ecumenical, all these other things, they, they take away from the truths that we all know deep down. What we all know deep down is that we need to be preaching the three angels' messages, Amen, and that's Cody. it. Amen, Cody. We need to live our lives in subjection to God and through his power overcome sin. But these other issues, they're not the focus. So when it comes down to the end of times, those who knew that they should be preaching the three angels' messages, and they decided that the Holy Spirit or the feast days was more important of a salvation issue than the will of the Father, which is to preach those messages, they'll be workers of iniquity at that point. It's very scary, Cody. It's very, very scary. Well, I think we sort of answered it, but I want to ask you um, anyway... It doesn't hurt to hit it again, I guess. Can you tell us, if not the feast days, what we should be focused on in these last days and why? Cody, I think Ellen White has made it crystal clear. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 12. Those messages, Cody, are given... Right after they're given in verses 14 through 16 in Revelation 14, there's a harvest. And the harvest, Jesus said in Matthew 13, is the end of the world. So, Cody, the three angels' messages were given to prepare a people to be ready when Jesus comes. So, Cody, if, if as Christians... As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, if our sole intent is to be ready when Jesus comes, and what other intent would a Christian have but to be ready when Jesus comes, then, Cody, it behooves every child of humanity to know, to study, to, and then to live in submission to the first, the second, and the third angel's message. To me, Cody, that's logical, that's reasonable, that's simple, and that's what God is. He's not asking us something hard or cruel or unjust. It's very simple. It's very reasonable. If we're focusing on anything but those messages, Cody, then we're distracted. And if we allow the devil to distract us too long, Cody, we will end up in the lake of fire. It's very simple. Thank you, Bill. Um, just to summarize, the feast days, as you pointed out in Galatians chapter 4 and Colossians chapter 2, they are no longer binding in the literal, earthly way. They are, if they're binding, it's in the spiritual context, in the prophetic context. Mm -hmm. All five of the feast days have meat offerings, drink offerings, holy, a holy day, new moon, and Sabbath days. That's what he's talking about in Colossians chapter 2. These were object lessons to point us to Christ and prophetic events surrounding Christ in the future. All of those feast days have been fulfilled or are in the process of being fulfilled except the last one, which will happen when Jesus returns, which is the Feast of Tabernacles. Correct. And when that happens, then all of those prophetic object lessons will be fully fulfilled and brought into their fullness. Now our mission today is to preach the three angels' messages. 
Anything else that gets in the way, anything else that is a distraction, we need to remove it. Absolutely. And when it says not to judge others in the feast days, that means we need to hearken unto the the teachings of the Bible and, and truly guard against what is very easy for all of us to fall into of being a Judaizer. We need to be Christians focused on the simple messages and not seeking these new light. Seek the old light that's already there because it's beautiful. And it's beautiful, as you mentioned, with the feast days. Study the feast days. Study them. Because you will learn what God is doing today, what Amen. he's done in the past, Amen. how he removes sin from the sinner and still upholds his law, but also removes sin from the sinner and turns us into perfect people. Amen. It's an amazing unbelievable system it's something I never could have thought up so the feast days they deserve your attention but keeping them at this point is missing the point and teaching others to do so is being completely distracted and will eventually lead to the lake of fire if we are focused on these other distractions about what and us defining what and what is not a salvation issue when the Bible is clear that we need to live in subjection to Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit to keep the law and to do the will of the Father so that when Jesus returns we will be ready because we have preached the three angels messages we have done our jobs amen Cody amen any other things you'd like to add Bill no you you hit it <laughs> Nailed it. I think the Holy Spirit helped you with that. <laughs> um, well, thank you all for joining us again. It's such a pleasure to do these interviews with Bill. I really enjoy them. I hope Bill does too. I think oh, he does. Absolutely. And it's great to talk about these issues and bring them, bring them out into the light. And now the decision is up to you on what, what choice you'll make in regards to uh, what we've stated here, whether or not you want to look into it more you'll see that the Bible is very clear on this issue as we brought out and 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 uh, well I hope that it is a blessing to all of you uh, thank you for joining us God bless